All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Vince Loera. Thank you guys so much for coming to our webinar. This has been a uh, quite a labor intensive effort for our team and we wanna extend our gratitude to all of you and for all of your interest and all of the support that we've received for this webinar. It's uh, been actually very amazing. Um, so we wanna introduce our webinar, uh, Stroke to Toes, Trailblazing the Future of VIR One Trial at a Time, presented by Dr. Joji Vatican-Cherry, FSIR Vascular and Interventional Radiologist at Kaiser Permanente LAMC. Next slide. So my name is Vince Loera. Is a, can you see? Yeah. Yes, I, I can see it. So my name is Vince Loera, rising MS4 at Chicago Medical School, and I would like to introduce my colleague and co-moderator, Omer Ali, current MS3 at UIC Rockford. Thanks, Vince, for the introduction. Um, I know a lot of a lot of you uh, have already met Dr. V through SIR and MSC and the reserves, and um, it's really a great honor to have him speak about these trials because he's definitely been um, really active in the community, and he's also been very involved in the research world. Um, not only that, but Dr. V Vatican Cherry has also been instrumental in organizing and supporting programming for RFS, especially for the MSC and the reserves for several several years. Um, and we're just really grateful to have him be a part of our team today um, and to talk about some really cool uh, landmark trials and also talk about how um, the field of interventional radiology has um, transformed the way we manage various critical patient populations that we all take care of today. Um, now I'd like to welcome Dr. V as our first speaker for the Stroke to Toes webinar. Great. Well, thanks a lot for the kind of introduction. Yeah, um, a lot of this work is uh, done by both Amara and Vince, so uh, a lot of credit to them for the, the presentation. Um, none of us have any disclosures. So what are objectives? So we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit of introduction to the field of VIR and really focus on stroke PAD and women's health. All right. I mean, it goes, like you said, head to toe. And we really have from that seminal work of Charles Daughter in that January 16, 1964, where he opened up Laura Shaw's artery and kept her leg alive. We've really transformed medicine and we continue to do it at a very really rapid and like robust rate. So we're going to talk about some of these landmark clinical trials, specifically in these three fields, and what the impact is, is on our patients and the public at large, all right? And also, uh, Sid's going to give you some tips and guidance in getting involved in VIR research as a medical student or resident, et cetera. So what is VIR? For those of you who are kind of uninformed, it's basically the future of surgery now. That's how I would say it, right? It's pinhole surgery or interventional surgery. It's basically we're managing complex diseases and ill patients throughout the human body uh, from head to toe. And uh, it's minimally invasive, but maximally effective. And most of it, it can now be done as an outpatient. So uh, that's the wonder of our specialty by making our incisions pinhole. Um, though we're really reconstructing the body in great ways, we're able to really transform them with minimal physiological impact. This is the scope of breadth of our practice, right? Perfarterial disease, lower extremity arteries, women's health, whether it be fibroids or fertility issues, et cetera, ischemic stroke, which is the number five killer in the US, portal hypertension issues, cancer, DVT, pulmonary embolus to the lungs and the heart, uh, compression fractures related to osteoporosis, prostate issues in elderly who can't urinate, um, renal vascular hypertension, um, you know, so on and so forth, and so much more. And it continues to expand at such a rapid rate. So I think this is why the time is uh, ripe for the picking. And this is why I think there's a lot of enthusiasm from trainees and students and, and people in the field right now. So when you're looking at transforming medicine, right, when you're starting to go against a gold standard of therapy, you have to think of three things, right? There's a standard of care, which could be from anecdotes or historical experience, but then there's a new thing that we bring in. And so how do I prove to the patient and the public and myself that what I'm offering is safe, uh, effective, durable? Because my goal is pre necessary. I do not want to cause harm. And some of what we do can cause harm, right? So we have to prove, uh, even though we believe in like the textbook suggests that it should work, doesn't mean it will work. 
So how safe is it compared to gold standard? How effective is it compared to gold standard and how durable it is? Because when we have an implant, like if you're doing a TAVR, you know, your aortic valve implantation, is that as durable? We know that short-term it's great, but in 20 years or 10 years, is that as durable, right? We know that a, a porcine or prosthetic valve will not last as long as a mechanical valve, even though the mechanical valve, you have to take Coumadin, and that's a big deal, whatnot. The porcine valve, you don't. It's still a durability issue that you have to think about based on the age of the population. Now, let's look at kind of the pyramid of evidence, right? So we're scientists, right? Even we're not quacks. That's why we're physicians. That's why we go through a, a medical school to get to that level as scientists, not we're using science and evidence and hypotheses and whatnot to generate um, our treatment plan. So really, we have to go beyond kind of case series or case reports, which is essentially anecdotes without a core lab adjudicating it and go to randomized trials. And not just one randomized trial, but multiple randomized trials saying the same thing. And that's really what a systematic review should have is high quality evidence supporting that this, uh, this hypothesis is true. All right, so let's talk about the stroke service line. All right, and this has been a huge change in the last six years, all right? So brain attack, you know, we know about heart attack, right? And that's been our focus for the last maybe two, three decades. Um, and because it's the number one cause of mortality in the US. But, you know, stroke is not that far behind and the risk factors are very similar, hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, which is really rapidly rising in the US and, and worldwide, are risk factors for heart attack, stroke, and PAD. And if you look outside of this year, it was the fourth leading cause of death, but, you know, I, unfortunately COVID has really taken over and is uh, leading to, uh, you know, ha, you know, ha, you know, so many deaths this year, and it's the number three cause of death in the U S. But when you look at disability, cause a stroke may not kill you, but it will make you not able to eat. So you need a feeding tube. You can't talk to your loved ones. You can't communicate. You can't move your body. You can't walk or talk. I mean, those are things that humans are used to doing. So it can be profoundly debilitating. And strokes are seen in a lot of the underrepresented minorities. Latinos and African-Americans are deeply impacted. And you can see a high preponderance in the Southeast. So pay attention to this kind of Southeast area. And we'll see this over and over again in other diseases, but something to be cognizant of. And if you look at the complication of stroke, I mean, it, paralysis, aphasia, unable to speak, uh, you know, numbness. Uh, depression, because obviously they're they're not humans want to walk and talk, and then when they're bedridden and pneumonias and so many things that can occur because of that. So how do we characterize an acute stroke? And that's important. You always have to stratify in some type of staging that makes prognostic implication. You don't want to just do staging for the sake of staging, but you want to do a staging in a sense that it means that I have a plan as how the prognosticate tell the patient what they're expecting outcomes are. Two is I want to know is that going to change my treatment algorithm. Right. So two things, prognostication and treatment is that's what the importance of staging is. So this is the NIH stroke scale, and it's based on level of consciousness, vision, motor and sensory impact, especially of extremities uh, and ability to speak. All right. These are the main things. And it gives us a scale of coins and from normal to severe stroke, the higher the score, the worse you're off. And that predicts outcomes. If it's a high score, you know, um, they're not going to do as well. All right, if it's a low score, they're going to do well, do better. Now, this is another thing that I, you know, the modified Rankin scale. And really what you're looking at is zero to two. Zero to two means you have functional independence, meaning I can be, if I had a stroke and I have a modified Rankin scale of zero to two, I can at least go on in my daily living, brush my teeth, wash, you know, um, you know, uh, cook my food or eat my food, things of any should do, you know, go to the bathroom on my own. These are things that people find important, right? Family members and the patient um, want to be able to do things on their own, their activities of daily living. So that's a zero to two is functional independence. So that's what we're looking for. All right. So let's look at the current, the historic regimen before 2015. Before, really what we had was mainly TPA, which is tissue plus immunogen activator, or an agent that's fibrinolytic. It breaks down fibrin, right? So it's that whole clotting cascade, which is super important for interventions to know. We gave this, and it was initially up to three hours, and then later data showed up to four and a half hours it was safe to give, all right? And that had a reduction in, in patients with disability. Now, we were going on with all these different devices, and you know, this is the Mercy device and Penumbra, and all these different devices started to be built. And with that, data started to come. 
And really, uh, this is the kind of the game changer. This thing right here is a little stent, basically, which when you put it in the clot, it expands and then grabs the clot. And you're able to pull it out. All right. And really, that was a dramatic change. And some of these aspiration devices with pumps, uh, different companies have made, also enabled us to do it. And uh, someone brought up Hermes in the, in the side chat. And really, we did have a, a transnational vascular interventional journal club specifically talking about Hermes, which is all the trials uh, together. But this was the first one in January 1st, 2015. It's the Mr. Clean. And what that was done, it was a Netherlands study of 500 patients, pretty large, randomized control trial, phase three trial, looking at mechanical thrombectomy of proximal, what's called ELVO or large vessel occlusion, meaning the middle cerebral artery M1 usually, or the carotid. So very proximal disease, which can be debilitating, compared to standard therapy. So again, interarterial therapy with a, you know, basically clot retrieval, unusual care versus usual care only. What did it show? A dramatic improvement in functional independence. So i.e. that zero to two, 33% of patients were functionally independent versus 19, and not with a, a significant bleeding complication rate. So really not a lot of harm, but a lot of tremendous benefit. And that was really the key. All right. So that was fine. We, we, it was impactful, right? Within three months, your modified ranking scale had dramatically increased. So if your family member had a, a large vessel occlusion, based on this trial, it would be justified to say, hey, we should really be at a stroke thrombectomy center. And there's not enough places in the country outside of the big cities where we can offer this therapy. So another reason why uh, we need to be thinking along those lines. And this is the, uh, the, the stent, and this is the clot that we're able to remove. These are all the trials that came out in 2015, subsequent to Mr. Clean, Extend IA, Escape, Swift Prime, and Reviscat, Spain, US, and Europe, uh, abroad, uh, Australia, the Netherlands, as we spent, and different uh, ends of numbers of people. independent analysis of all those patients showcasing the benefit as well. So really we see that clearly stroke works. And if you see before 2015, the trials were negative, right? Meaning when we did interarterial thrombolysis or interarterial procedures, they had higher, didn't really clearly show a benefit, right? IMS3 and other trials didn't show a benefit. So if we stopped there, we would have failed. Uh, Manny Goyle, who is from all the Institute of Medical Sciences in Alberta, uh, Canada, his goal, he was a PI on uh, some of these trials, the only trial that actually showed a mortality reduction. Um, and what he showed in this Canadian trial was that he was like, hey, listen, I believe in this. I believe in thrombectomy. And instead of having cognitive dissonance and saying that the other trials are nonsense and garbage, he said, I need to prove it. So he, was, he and others were able to design these trials and prove it because they so strongly believed in it. But now it's core lab adjudicated, evidence-based, multiple trials, and the Hermes analysis also showcased it. And I agree, they're pretty creative names that, that are out there. Now, they thought, like, maybe we can go further. And the concept is this. If you look at a stroke, what happens is, or any tissue, within about six hours, you'll have death of a tissue, right? Whether it be the brain, the leg, the kidney, if you have complete occlusion, you have a time frame of where it stops, it dies, right? And then you, if you reperfuse it, hemorrhage and whatnot can occur, right? There, or reperfusion injury to the intestines, anything can occur, right? Kidneys, intestines, legs, whatever it is. So this dead tissue, you're not, it's, it's liquefactive necrosis, right? It's not going to recover. But this penumbra of ischemic tissue, which is still alive, it's just stunned, can wake up. Same thing with a heart attack and the peri, can, the peri heart can still recover, right? The ischemic stunned myocardium or hibernating myocardium can recover with vascularization. Same thing with the brain. But the brain, the liquefactive necrosis is a big deal. And the reperfusion hemorrhage is a big deal because if it hemorrhages, then they can herniate or have a lot of mass effect and midline shift and all these other problems. So each organ has a little different thing, but there's a lot of overlap. But what we do with this diffusion perfusion, diffusion is an MRI sequence that shows you the dead area. Perfusion shows you the area that has lack of circulation. So if the perfusion is broader than the diffusion, it suggests to me that I have salvageable brain. So then that patient who may have that, uh, you know, the right side fix the left leg and arm may not be able to move their left leg or arm, then if I can open this up, they may be able to do that now, all right? And there's two trials that said 
the same thing. This, um, the diffuse three, up to 16 hours and the dawn up to 24 hours. Okay, so again, these are some pretty big, uh, pretty big deal. And these are two randomized trials that show that up to 24 hours, we can do this. So again, this is uh, moving the needle even further and further. Now, this is an example of a patient um, uh, who had the left middle cerebral artery. So the, this whole carotid artery is feeding the whole brain, all right? But um, the left middle cerebral artery, this is the anterior cerebral, right? So remember that kind of homunculum where the leg is here, an arm and the hand down this way, right? Just remember that homunculum is still important. The neuroanatomy is still important for you as an interventionalist. If you look, this middle cerebral is gone. So you get the catheter and sheath up and you use the stent, you put the stent in here, which is this, and you pull out the clot and then you get what's called ticky flow or high ticky three flow, which is normal perfusion of that area and hyperemia. That's what you want. Now, we've clearly shown the benefit of that in 2015. And with Dawn and Fuse 3, we've taken out not beyond the six to eight hours, but up to 24 hours, right, with good imaging. Now we're just tweaking it. We're trying to make it even better and better. So is Altaplace the right medicine for IV or is Tenecteplace? And there's data compelling that says Tenecteplace, which is another fibrinolytic, which is a little bit more fibrin specific, may be better with less side effects of hemorrhage and more recanalization. So that's what we're looking for. Now, is there different techniques in how to remove the clot? That's another thing we're looking at. And then what blood thinner should we put on? There's some data, if you look at the DOAX, which are the direct oral anticoagulants, the direct 10A inhibitors, or even direct thrombin inhibitors, like you know, dabigatran, uh, uh, pixaban, doxaban, rivaroxaban, they may have a less bleeding rate than warfarin or, or low, low molecular weight heparin, et cetera. So just something you should be cognizant of because you, again, your goal is to reduce adverse events and improve the efficacy of preventing another event, especially in the history of atrial fibrillation with what's called a chads 2 vast meaning do they have CHF, do they have hypertension, do they have an older age, do they have diabetes, have they had prior stroke, are they female, do they have vascular disease? All those things put you at higher risk of, of clotting in atrial fibrillation causing a stroke. But also those are similar things that are risk factors for bleeding, which is the has blood score. So remember those things, always risk and benefits of every intervention. The other thing we need to do better, not only is, is the pharmacological adjuncts and the technical adjuncts, but also can we improve the process? Can we get patients to a thrombectomy center in a faster fashion? Do we do an ER ambulance that has a CT scanner get the CAT scan and push IVTP quickly? Can we get more interventionalists and more of you students that go to training programs and get strokes trained, okay? And, and those are kind of the key things that we wanna look for. Now, there's some interesting things that, um, you know, that the Omer and Vincent, Vincent uh, identified is like, maybe we can do this magnetic enhanced diffusion therapy or are there neuroprotective agents will, that'll keep that ischemic penumbra safe, you know, that peri uh, area safe. Um, and prevent that transition to infarction? And will ultrasound guidance do something to do it where you just don't even have to go catheter, you put an ultrasound probe here and it, it agitates the clot and resolves it. So there's a lot of ongoing work and we're moving, we're gonna keep on moving that direction. All right, so that's stroke in a nutshell, right? It's a fifth leading cause of death, most severe disabling patients. And, so, and it's gonna happen to one of our family members, unfortunately. So we need to make sure we know about BFAST, balance, vision, facial droop, arm or leg weakness, speech difficulty, either understanding or, or expressing or speaking, right? And then time, time is that every minute's 2 million neurons. So we need more of you trained in this, in neurointerventional. You'll have the skill set, understand the NH stroke scale, understand the neuro IC aspect of it, understand the trials, and then learn the therapy, the technical therapy, which is probably the easy part. Let's talk about women's health. So this is a palm Cohen, which is a, you know, a way to kind of stratify abnormal uterine bleeding, right? Because patients are going to present, they won't, you won't know if they have fibroids unless you have anatomic imaging, but they're going to have, you know, some process of either excessive bleeding, irregular bleeding or spotting or something that's going to be happening, right? So we're dealing with a lot of fibroids and adenomyosis, which are two causes of both pelvic pain and um, excessive bleeding or menorrhagia, which was historic to cold. And so... Um, it can be different things. So, so we'll deal with adenomyosis and lymoma, but we have to be cognizant of malignancies, including endometrial hyperplasia, because you're going to see this patient de novo. And so you want to make sure that they have, don't have irregular periods, that they don't have intermenstrual bleeding, 
that they're po- peri- you know they're not postmenopausal bleeding or that the, you know, the ultrasound shows thickening of the endometrium or the MRI shows some abnormality that's concerning that would require either endometrial biopsy or something more. So you have to be cognizant of all these things in your differential and your processing when you're seeing these patients. The fecal classification guides the, us to where the fibroids can be. Is it endocavitary on a thin polyp? Is a submucosal with the, you know, most of it endocavitary or part of it inside? Is it in the muscle myometrium or is it subserosal and it's pedunculated? So all these are things that the fecal classification enables you to do. And it's important for stratifying what treatment we have. Um, fibroids are seen are benign, right? The chance of it being a leiomyosarcoma is pretty rare, one in 500 to one in 1,000. And usually there's going to be some telltale sign. Your treatment didn't work. Your follow-up is still enhancing something, right? And it's the most common reason for hysterectomy in the U.S. Again, the main symptoms are excessive heavy menses, which is like sometimes they require transfusions, but usually they present with a chronic anemia, right? And they require iron supplementation, et cetera, or bulk symptoms. That fibroid uterus is compressing the bladder, making them urinate a lot, or compressing the rectum, making them constipated, or compressing the lumbar sacral plexus, causing back pain. Sometimes the femoral nerve is impacted and they, they'll have anterior thigh pain. So these are things that you will see in your office when you're seeing these patients. And we do what's called the UFS quality of life. We do a quality of life survey based on various questions that we asked and they rate it. And we get a symptom severity score and a health related quality of life score. Now you can see that the other thing that's important is that it's a commonly seen, more commonly seen in the African-American population, all right? And so these are things to be cognizant of when we're dealing with this. And it's a large expenditure. And it's interesting, actually, if you look, Kamala Harris wants to spend a lot more money on, on fibroid uh, uh, management. So, you know, as far as from a governmental standpoint, she realizes this is probably under um, treated or under recognized uh, uh, as far as importance. And yeah, I agree that MS, uh, MSC as usual uh, brings it and they did this infographic. So good job with the SIR MSC doing this. So, um, this can be what it looks like on a laparoscope, and it rarely ever looks like this, but it can look like what it's on the right. You'll usually feel the pubic symphysis, and you'll march up to the umbilicus and above, and the number of centimeters give you kind of the gravidity of the uterus or how roughly big it is, and we use MRI to kind of guide us. So what's our treatment algorithm? So if they're not that bothered, you leave it alone, but symptomatic treatment, iron supplementation, non steroidals hormonal therapy, or they go for, um, you know, hormonal therapy included progesterone, uh, or Depo, Depo Provera, or Lupron, it's a GnRH analog, right? So those things will suppress it, but they have their own uh, potential issues. And they don't reduce the symptoms dramatically. Lupron or GnRH analogs like Lupron do, but they also start to lose bone mineral density. So you have to be cognizant of that. You can only give that so much before you have irreversible mineral loss and risk of osteoporosis, things of that nature. So again, laparoscopic options, transvaginal, transabdominal, or open hysterectomy, myomectomy are all also considerations. So the patient should definitely be counseled on all of that. And here's uh, what we do. We get a tiny catheter all the way to the uterine artery, past all the other branches and then internal iliac artery, and put these little beads, these embospheres or uh, trisiculated gelatin microspheres, little polymer beads that are 500 microns. Remember, a red blood cell is only about seven microns or nine microns, right? So a capillary is five, mil, uh, five microns, right? So you can tell roughly what, what level of the arterial bed you're going to be embolizing. So this uh, ME trial is probably one of the bigger ones. It's, um, it's, it's pretty exciting because it's about 180 patients who are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to hysterectomy to UAE. And really, we're looking at safety and efficacy, right? And efficacy is really kind of bleeding primarily. And again, one-to-one, -one, about 80 to 90 patients each limb. And what they did, they followed it two years, five years, and 10 years. And looked again at primary outcomes of did the bleeding get controlled? And then all quality of life issues. And then secondary issues of length of stay, technical failures, et cetera. So let's look at this data. And these are the, the publications and where they were published. Two-year data, five-year data, and ultimately 10-year data. And this guy, Jim Reekers, is a vascular and vascular radiologist from the Netherlands who was a daughter lecturer. So he was the PI on on these trials. So let's look at this data and uh, showcase what it showed. So in out of that 80 patients, they had a four, uh, four technical failures, which is pretty rare in this day and age with microcatheters. And if you look at the trial data, their experience of doing UFIs was limited, right? So when you're doing interventional surgical trials, you should always look at the operator experience and people learn this from carotid trials, et cetera. So how many, there's always sometimes what's called a roll-in phase. So if you look at Crest, which is a carotid stenting trial, they really 
very rigorously looked at the procedures that the interventionals did and made sure that the technical um, nuances were followed. So that's one thing we should look at when you're doing a technical clinical or technical procedure or surgical trial, you should look at the surgeons or the interventionalists and see, do they have enough experience and skill set to do these safely and well, otherwise your study will fail. So that's something to be cognizant of, of an interventional trial. And so obviously those four ended up going to hysterectomy. Readmission rates were higher for hysterectomy or for uh, UAE versus hysterectomy. And so we have to ask, why is that? But if you look at kind of the quality of life scores, uh, you know, they were pretty comparable, you know, a little bit of deviation over time, but pretty good, pretty similar satisfaction from the patient, very similar uh, in hysterectomy UAE. All right. So again, quality of life scores are pretty good overall. Um, again, satisfaction in 10 years, still, they're pretty satisfied, very satisfied, satisfied. And that's reflects my own practice, you know? So, um, so the challenge is, it wasn't the largest trial. You know, we saw that the MR, Mr. Clean was uh, 500 patients this is about 200, right? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the other question is, um, there was a, obviously there's always a loss of follow-up, you know, because in any trial, it's never perfect where you have hundred percent follow-up, but the more follow-up issues, that's a problem. The other thing is if there's crossover and why were there so many large number of bounce backs for UAE? And how long did the interventional physician, the operating surgeon, follow up the patient? And why didn't they repeat the urinary position? My practice, I follow them now based on the ME data for 10 years. And I have repeated UAE interventions. And I do get an MRI at six months. And if there's enhancement, I'm worried that they will recur. Um, and I think that's important. Okay, so just be cognizant of these things. And you should look at other, if we're not following these patients for 10 years based on this data, where over time, there was recurrences and failures, then are we doing the right thing for the patient? That's what I wonder. Okay. So it's clearly safe and effective and it's an alternative hysterectomy patients, you know, and, uh, and this is an example of the hit dropout. So two years, 19 hysterectomies in the UAE population, another four at five years, another five at 10 years. So if you're following this patient, you could certainly offer a hysterectomy, but you could also uh, do a repeat uterine fibroid embolization. And that's what I've offered my patients. You know, because usually they're pretty satisfied. But again, if you're not the one following it one month, six month, and yearly, and you're not taking care of the perioperative pain, right? Then, and you're not counseling. I spend a lot of time counseling on what to expect and the importance of taking their non steroidals, ibuprofen, 800 TID with meals and water. Uh, their constipation of pain can be worse than the actual pelvic cramping pain. So I tell them to absolutely take, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the softeners, stool softeners, and uh, adequate hydration. Right. This is you got to spend the time in pre-op in clinic talking about all these and the expectations have to be set of how much pain they're going to have um, and when it's going to get better. And if you do that and you are available to the patient with a phone call that they can reach you, you will have much less balance back to the office or the hospital at ER. But if it, you're the surgeon, you're the interventional surgeon are not following the patient, then they will have bounce backs, you know, so just something to think about. And so you also should follow them because at least for 10 years or until menopause, um, because you can, you can catch them when they do recur, or sometimes they're passing some fibroid tissue. You can tell them not to get alarmed. You will prevent a lot of hysterectomies if you follow your patient. But if you're doing this and you're just one and done, well, you're going to hurt your patients. You know, you're not going to provide the best care. Maybe you shouldn't be doing it because technically we can do a lot you should answer the not could we but should we all right and these are just MRIs. this is an angiogram this is a catheter into the uterine artery these are some supragluteal and pregluteal this tortuous thing is a uterine artery and this enhancing is the fibroid these are the this is what's called a t1 weighted image and it's an axial image meaning it's a cross section of like a loaf of bread of the body looking from the feet up and these little things these white things here this is with gadolinium or contrast are bright because they're very vascular. So that's the T1. Afterwards, you can see you get shrinkage, up to 50% shrinkage of the fibroids, and they're devascularized, completely no, no flow to them. And that's what you want to see. So if I see that in my six-month follow-up, my likelihood of recurrence is pretty low based on Pelage's data. But this is an important, con I, so not everyone gets MR, so you, sometimes insurance won't allow it, but I tend to because it gives me ideas of adenomyosis, is there any ovarian and tubal pathology? And my follow-up, is there shrinkage? Is there devascularization? So I know that my likelihood of recurrence is low.
Now, another thing to do, now this is a little bit off topic, but still important for women's health, is if you look at our maternal mortality, it is one of the worst in the developed nations, okay? I mean, we're like 47 in the world. It's pretty bad. And so we need to figure out part of the reason is postpartum hemorrhage, but there's many other reasons. Um, and if you look at postpartum hemorrhage, it's basically you have uterine anatomy, you have blood, you may have retained products of conception, so many things potentially could go on. So there's different things they can do. They can do a balloon, a very compliant balloon in the, in the uterus. They can suture it down, they can pack it. There's a lot of things they can do. And then they also do a lot of medicines, right? Um, things to kind of stimulate the uterine anatomy and contract down and uh, different medications are given, okay? So those are great but may not be enough, right? So we can offer a role, but, and these are things that when I get called in the middle of the night, I'm ready to go because you can save a life and save a uterus and potentially preserve fertility, right? So there's a huge amount of impact that we can have. And I think not only in the, here in the US, but abroad, we're really trying to give this uh, option available because you know, be, it's really horrible when the, you know, the family, just the husband and wife are there together, the wife just gave birth, and the baby, even if they're okay, the, the mom passed away during the childbirth. That's devastating. That happened a lot because of bleeding. Less so now, but still we can do a lot better. So again, another reason why we as interventionists need to be all over the country providing this care. All right. So what about peripheral disease service line? So this is where we started. And so this is the OG. This is uh, Charles Theodore Daughter. And so it's imperative that everyone learns how to do this. If you're a vascular interventional surgeon, right, you're an interventional surgeon, you should be able to do the treatment of your original, the OG, or the original father of our specialty, all right? And, and, and I'll tell you why it's important. He was the youngest academic chair of readouts. He was truly a visionary. He had thought of things, surgery without a scalpel, and things that we're doing yet to do that he's already thought of. It's, it's pretty compelling. And this is Laura Shaw. She's 82 year old, bad heart. She was offered nothing but an amputation, but she said, I do not want an amputation. I'd rather die. And so she had a, a flush, a high severe stenosis, a superficial femoral artery near the ductal canal, which is a common place for atherosclerosis. And what daughter did is got a wire across it and these Teflon serial dieters, eight and 12. And he was able to score through and open up the plaque. And she, she was able to, her toes auto amputated and she, she was able to resol resolve her gangrene and walk on her toes, uh, walk on her feet uh, for a couple more years until she died of CHF. <coughs> Excuse me. So even daughter back then published his data <coughs> of uh, 11 extremities, him and Melvin Jenkins, his first fellow published. And um, with good, good results. So even then back in AHA in circulation, they published his first data. Now, what is PAD? Basically, it's hardening of the arteries in the arteries below the, excuse me, give me one second. <coughs> so it's hardening of the arteries um, and it impacts about 8 million people in the US. And the common manifestations are leg pain, <coughs> i.e. claudication, but also ulcers or gangrene. So if the ulcer doesn't heal within six weeks, something's wrong. Either the infection or it's bad circulation, but they should heal. So just something to be cognizant of. And this is an important classification uh, uh, by Bill Rutherford. And it's how do you stratify these patients? So, so if you're a student coming on my service, I always want you to know this thing, or a resident or intern, I want you to know this zero to six. So just memorize this. And basically, what this entails you to do is to figure out how bad the disease is. The stage of classification that tells you how bad it is, but also prognostication and treatment. So if you look, when you get to rest pain, that means when you're sleeping at night, you're level to the heart. You're so dependent on gravity, you have to dangle your foot over the bed to get flow, that, that pipe of blood from the, from the knee down is required for you to sustain circulation. Otherwise you have pain because your leg is ischemic, your toes are ischemic. So that's rest pain. So then if you have minor tissue like toes or major tissue loss, which is like midfoot, hindfoot, that's 
bad, right? And we could stratify it based on different parameters of, uh, you know, toe pressures and whatnot, but that's basically what it comes down to. Okay. Um, so when you have claudication, it may be atypical because these patients are older, they may have arthritis in the hip and the ankle and the knee, but they often will show up with big muscle pain, right? So if you run or you exercise, you get that ischemic, you kind of get that pain, right? In your thigh or your buttock or your calf when you're you know, doing sprints or whatever, it's similar to that. But they're doing it with minimal walking or minimal ambulation. So they stop walking because it hurts. Um, so when you have critical ischemia, their ankle brachial indices are low, their toe pressures are low, um, they have pain at rest at night. They have uh, dependent rhubarb power elevation, which I'll talk about. Um, but uh, we could do stuff. This is a classic uh, finding. You'll see in the office, you'll have a patient, their feet are red, rubrous, because of capillary, their arterioles are maximally vasodilated at all time. But when you elevate it to 30 degrees or above, they will get pallor elevation. So they get, frankly, ischemic. Dependent rubber power elevation is a classic sign, the burger sign of critical ischemia or, or ischemic leg. But unfortunately, this is what ends up happening. We do uh, below knee or above knee amputations, ideally below knee because it can at least wear a prosthesis, above knee, not so much. So we cut below the, you know, the SFA profunda, and then you put a little flap. Because sometimes this, this flap doesn't heal well, and then it's you have to get a proper orthotics, and they may or may not be able to sustain that depending on how it is. And sometimes they get bedridden, and then they have a heel ulcer in the other foot, they become bilateral amputees, and so on and so forth. So we want to prevent that. A few ways to do it. Historically, they before daughter, you had to do a bypass. But if their heart was bad, their lungs were bad, they couldn't undergo anesthesia, they had no good vein, it was an amputation. Now with the interventional radiologists, uh, vascular interventional radiologists or vascular interventional surgeons like us who are doing these procedures and you know, cardiologists and some, uh, and some vascular surgeons, all of them are able to provide this kind of endovascular route as well. So I think daughter really changed the way we think of things because again, the circulation artery veins and lymphatics are our highway to fix disease. And we use balloons and stents, which are metal scaffolds to open up the vessels. So now what happened is, you know, from daughter's age, he daughtered it. And then after that, we had um, Palmaz developed the balloon expandable stent, which is a metal stent that Julio Palmaz was a vascular medical radiologist. The UT San Antonio developed this uh, device. And that's been in millions and millions of coronary arteries throughout the, the world over time, since the 80s. And then um, in the SFA, where daughter first worked, we've never had a good solution. Stents would fracture, stents wouldn't work, balloons wouldn't keep open for long. And then there's um, some people had a bright idea, I think that Lindsay McCann was one of them, of maybe if I use a chemo drug, which stops synthesis, right? Because what happens is once you open up the plaque or, or disrupt it, it just, the artery forms scar tissue and it forms this thick tenacious scar tissue, which is called intimal hyperplasia. So how do you avoid that or prevent that? If you can figure that out, you will get a Nobel prize because no one has been able to yet. But the Paxitaxel is a, basically a cytotoxic drug that stops uh, mitosis. So Zilver PTX is Paxitaxel on this stent that eludes it. And now what they did was, okay, in theory, it's great because they had a trial called Sirocco in the, in the early 2000s, which was a serolimus drug eluding stent in the SFA, which was a negative trial, meaning it didn't have a benefit. So they tried this new drug, the Paxitaxel, and hooked up this to a stent, and they said, in animal models, et cetera, probably showed some benefit, and then they figured out, let's try it on others. So uh, Michael Dake, who's a vascular vegetable surgeon, um, uh, he was a, who's the father of thoracic aortic invention, so a vascular vegetable radiology physician uh, who was at Stanford at the time, he's now in Arizona. He was the primary investigator on this trial. Gary Ansel, who who's a, is an interventional cardiologist, a peripheral surgeon, peripheral cardiologist, um, is, uh, was actually just won the, one of the uh, investigate, uh, you know, kind of the career achievement award at, at um, ISET this past year. Yeah, last this early this week, actually. So congratulations to him. So a lot of big names on this trial. Lindsay McCann, who was one of the originators of the Paxitaxel, Bob Smoose and Richard Saxon, some, another, a couple other IR doctors who are pretty busy in the SFA bed. 
So basically 500 patients, mostly clodicant. So always remember the disease process you're dealing with. Here, you're not dealing with this critical ischemia, the sickest, the sickest, the heavily calcified diabetic patients. So when you're looking to implement this device, you can't say apples and oranges. Oh, since it worked in that population, I could use it here. Not necessarily. So always look at your study and who the inclusion and exclusion criteria were for, because you can't necessarily extrapolate that to your patient if they don't follow in that. That's important. All right, remember that. Look at the inclusion exclusion criteria. Don't just let it read the line. Know the patient and what they're, what was going on. Because if you try to implement it in another patient, it may have the opposite effects. So that's why post-market analysis and registries are always important because we need real-world data to protect patients from those things. But ultimately, what this study showed was that there's a sustained benefit of the drug, all right? In five years, your primary patency was better with drug eluting stent versus angioplasty or, or bare metal stents, all right? Again, patency was better with the drug eluting stent versus the bare metal stents or standard therapies. And I think that's a big deal, right? So patency is definitely better. So we started using this, right? We started using this because it showed a benefit. It showed improved patency. Now, Katsanos did a meta-analysis a couple of years ago. He's from the UK. Um, he's an interventional radiologist and a statistician where he did all these prospective randomized trials and he looked up to five years and he did a meta-analysis. And there was a lot of concern that there may be an increase in mortality. So basically the FDA said, hey, hey, wait a second, maybe we shouldn't be using this drug. So now there's been other trials like SweetPad and independent analysis of the data saying maybe there isn't that same issue. But you have to always you know, take every study with a grain of salt and also look at, even the endpoint was a mortality, we need to maybe think about that in the future. So we've done a lot of analysis and we don't believe it's there, but you always have to counsel a patient that there may be, based on the Katsana's meta-analysis of multiple randomized trials, there may be some risk of increased mortality. So we always have to tell patients, right? Because our goal is premium necessary. So <laughs> you always have to stay attuned. Don't take one study at face value and say you're done. Now, the one thing is you as a vascular interventional surgeon who's taking care of patients, if you don't provide the medical pharmacologic therapy, you're doing a disservice to the patient. Meaning if you're not putting them on a statin or a zetamib or, or antiplatelets or direct thrombin inhibitors like River Rocks based on Compass and Voyager, uh, et cetera, or ACE or ARB. Um, if you're not counseling them on smoking cessation or putting them on varenicline or ed educating them to exercise, you've done a disservice to that patient. Why is that? Because ultimately the patient will have a bad outcome and die of a heart attack or stroke, or you could have prevented a surgery by having them exercise and smoke first rather than fixing their SFA. So you at least have to offer that to them, right? That's the right thing to do. So remember that. When you're doing the science is great, but there's also other alternatives. So even though there are interventional surgeons who are less invasive than open surgery, we're not as less invasive in exercise and arguably less, not less invasive or less risky than, than dietary modification. So think of that. So this is an SFA, this disease, um, you put in a stent, nice patency, and their claudication goes away. But again, they're going to die of a heart attack and stroke in five years, about a quarter of them. So. Now, what are we at now? What are they exciting? So it's great that Zilver PTX is great. The drug and the stent work. Five-year patency is better. Now we're using the, imper the imperial trial, the Luvia, which is a drug eluting stent with Paxitaxel on a, on a different platform stent and comparing them head-to-head, one-to-one, -to -one, and it's showing improvements of the Luvia as far as patency goes, some other side effects, but at least one to two years, the, there's a divergence in the curve of patency, at least in Luvia in that population. So now we're comparing drug to drug, stent to stent, which is ideal. Now, if you do a compare to trial, you go, oh, well, this study showed 90% patency, this is over, and that study showed 80% patency against bare metal stent. So the 90% patency stent should be better. You've made a, a, a misjudgment. Why? Because you're comparing apples and oranges. If that 90% patency was in a healthier bed of tissue, well, of course, you're going to have better patency. So you have to do direct comparison in a randomized controlled trial uh, head to head. It has to be done, otherwise you can't state that. And unfortunately, people will come and tell you that. They'll go, oh yeah, yeah, clearly this is better. Look at the numbers. Don't be fooled by that. You have to protect the patient from this. 
Now, there's some cool technology. Disrupt PAD3 just came out, and this is a, shot, uh, a lithoplasty balloon. So we've, we've been using this in our lab for heavily calcified lesions so we don't have to put implant. Because remember that resinosis can be pretty brutal, especially with stents. So, you know, more data to follow, but it is exciting technology. This is what's called a bullfrog. But basically what it does, it injects dexamethasone by poking the needle into the intima and allowing it to reduce intimal hyperplasia theoretically. So these are, again, have to be studied and proven, but but it's interesting, right? This is a way to do an endovascular bypass. So do you even need a surgical bypass? Well, we go into the artery, we actually connect into the vein and then go back to the artery past the blockage and put a, a covered stent. So this is called a detour. Um, and basically uh, the reason why the blood, there's no blood clot because the vein is so big, there's flow still going to the heart through the valves, but you still get integrated flow to these covered stent grafts. So it's a, it's a way of doing a percutaneous interventional bypass. Um, now this whole thing called deep venous arterialization, something that's very exciting. There's actually trials ongoing. So, you know, we haven't implemented this, but it's very interesting where you basically have a blockage. It's called SAD disease, small artery disease. So you can't revascularize them. You can't do surgery to re bypass them. You can't do, um, uh, endovascular fix, but what you can do is you connect the artery to the vein and you put in a stent. And then what it happens is you tear the valves of the vein and now the blood goes backward from the artery all the way to the vein, to the capillary. So the oxygenated blood goes to the thing and potentially can heal it. Now we need data to prove it, it's exciting, but we don't know if it really works or it harms. So, you know, these are no option CLI patients are going to amputation. This is just another consideration that we have. And this is a wound, gangrene, amputation to healing, to healed. Now, one of the other things we should be cognizant of and be weary of is this, right? And this is, again, why we need more interventionalists trained in, you know, these different diseases, stroke and PAD and CLI and, you know, women's health issues, et cetera. Because if you look at the amputation rates, uh, if you look at where slavery was abound, uh, abundant, right, south of Mason-Dixon line, and you look at where the, the highest numbers of amputation rates are, there's uh, some correlate. And oddly enough, even in this, that area, there's a lot of uh, strokes, so stroke, PED, women health, all these issues are things that we should be considering. So in summary, kind of patients fight hard. We need to train and fight harder, okay? So uh, I'm gonna really quickly uh, talk about a couple of things. Um, and we're running out of time, but uh, basically, uh, um, um, you know, this was from a daughter lecture by Andy Adams, Vinny Vinny Vanish. So how do you train to, to do this? One of the risks of our, our field is we're really good at innovating. We generate development idea that migrates out and there's lots of procedures because we haven't comprehensively managed disease or own the disease. And I think we have to stop that. And how do we stop that? We have to have clinic, right? We have to have clinic where we see patients and manage disease. One of the challenges we historically had is I think we were, you know, what Andy Adams suggested in his talk is perhaps we were fishing from the long pond. We were fishing from people who didn't necessarily want to take care of patients. If you're an interventional surgeon, your primary role is taking care of patients. So clinic is very important. So if you're not willing to spend the time in the office or spend the time talking to the patient, probably not an ideal field, right? Because ultimately you're going to have bad outcomes, right? If the interventionalist in the, you know, in that trial had a better job counseling patients and following the patients, maybe they wouldn't have such some of these results. So that's something to think about. You're responsible for your surgeon, no one else. Don't assume anything. Um, so the other thing is, if you look at clinic, why is clinic so important? The first six letters of clinician is clinic. It's critical for sustainable success. And really it's the most important part of medicine, right? You're the guidance counselor. This is what patients are looking for. That can't be replaced or replicated or commoditized. And if you look at our historic training in radiology, and you're spending a lot of time on these like dysplasias and these other things, we really should be spending time in your techniques and diabetes and hypertension, and high cholesterol. And that's why the American Board of Medical Specialties recognized that IR should be its own field, separate from radiology, separate from radon. It became the 37th specialty medicine in September, 2012. And we shifted our paradigm in our curriculum from uh, procedure focus to disease focus. So Comprehensive management of diabetes, hypertension, statins, antiplatelets, anticoagulants, knowing the natural history of disease, prognosis, the studying more in pharmacology and physiology, and lifelong long term follow up. And really, the goal is to embrace the critical clinical components of VIR. So, you need to have an outpatient clinic, you need to have inpatient missions and a consult service. Currently, our model, uh, as I've talked to many students, is not quite where it needs to be. Three months and three years is inadequate, and those are the gap years and lost years that are dangerous to it being a clinician. And that's what you want to be. You want to be a good doctor to the patient. Um, so what we've advocated is your fourth year, make sure you do, I know in the COVID era, you can't, but two or three IR sub eyes, 
vascular surgery block, and then interventional cardiology or cardiology consults, neurointerventional, uh, surgical sub -I. Those are high yield months so that your first year, MS4 is a clinical year, is your first year of clinical training because you're not going to get as much clinical training as your counterparts in surgery or medicine. So recognize that Achilles heel that you have. And then during the PGY2-3, do a good surgical internship with ICU and vascular surgery, et cetera. It'll be busier, but you'll get more out of it, all right, if you go to the right program. And the two, three, four years, don't just do one month. Don't be just in the diagnostic thing. You got to see patients. You got to do procedures. You got to see patients. You got to see in the office. So remember that, okay? Um, and then in the PGY5, continue to do more than one month of ICU. Do CCU, MICU, vascular surgery, INR. You need to get stroke trained. So make sure you pay uh, adherence to that and do a clinic of some sort weekly. All right, that's pretty much uh, all I have. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be on the chat, and uh, I'll send it up to Sid. Sid? Yep. Um, all right, uh, thank you so much, Dr. V, for, for your talk. Um, I, I've been to a few uh, so far and in each one I learned something new. So I really appreciate this one as well. Um, I have the privilege to talk to you about pursuing vascular interventional radiology research as a medical student. As a uh, brief outline of who I am, um, I'm a graduating fourth year medical student from the integrated BAMD program at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. I was very fortunate to have matched into interventional radiology this year or vascular and interventional radiology this year. Um, I'll be attending Duke University for a surgical prelim year and I'll be staying there as well, following um, that for my radiology and IR, IR training. One interesting thing about my journey, which I feel is perhaps one of the reasons I was invited to talk to you um, today, is in between medical school or between the third and fourth year of my training as a medical student, I decided to take a dedicated year off and pursue a Master of Science in Clinical Investigation. During that time, I worked with um, Dr. Vedantam, who's the national PI of the ATTRACT trial, which is a uh, completed trial um, on looking at DVT lysis for acute DVT and the ongoing C-TRAC trial. So I was able to get some incredible experience in the randomized clinical trial research and overall clinical trial research overall. And I remain a strong advocate for research in interventional radiology, and I remain also a strong advocate for medical student research in interventional radiology, as I do certainly feel like there's a niche there. Um, Amir, can we go to the next slide? So oftentimes, um, I've talked to a few medical students who've approached me about pursuing research in vascular interventional radiology, and one of the main questions I get is, how did you know that you wanted to do clinical trial research or you wanted to focus on research in venous disease. Um, I think at this stage of our career, it's, it's a great idea to keep an open mind. Uh, the nice thing about vascular interventional radiology is that it has several service lines um, and lots of things that can excite us throughout our entire field. And I've often met attending interventional radiologists who are passionate about one thing at one point of their career, and they may transition to something else later. So I think it's really hard to say, hey, this is going to be my niche as a medical student. But that being said, through a talk like this or through an experience in clinic or the hospital, I think you can start getting an idea that, hey, maybe this thing interests me a little bit more than something else did, or I thought that device or technique that we used was cool. I think try to keep a mental note of those moments in your training and see if you can explore those things a little bit further. Why exactly did you find that exciting? And who exactly led that innovation or that research behind it? For me, I had a lot of patients inside the clinic who were suffering from DVT. I saw that almost every patient in the hospital had pneumatic compression stockings for DVT, VTE prevention. Um, I was also interested in randomized clinical trials. And when I started looking up the uh, randomized clinical trials in uh, interventional radiology, the ATTRACT trial had just been completed. So my mentor's name, Dr. Vedantam, came up pretty frequently. Um, and that's really how I got involved with reaching out to him and, and eventually working with him. But it was really as simple as that, is just a little bit of hunch. And as I got further into it, um, I started to become more and more passionate about it. 
but please don't feel upset if you don't have like a clear focused understanding right now oh this is what i want to do i think research is also a good exploratory tool into the specialty itself so please be sure to keep an open mind um next slide that being said um there are many ways to find research mentors in vascular and interventional radiology for me um i did a lot of emailing to mentors both within my institution and then when I was looking to a research here outside of my institution. I talked to residents, I got involved with SIR, RFS, spoke to other med students who had done research. So it's it's always important to try to seek out every avenue that's possible, that's possibly there. And the reason I say that is because as a rising medical student, I found that the process is often very daunting in the beginning. You can reach out to mentors and sometimes they don't respond to your emails. Sometimes they respond to your emails and they're not the stellar home run emails that you might be hoping for saying, hey, here's a paper that, you know, that we're working on, IRBs approved, and you can just jump on board and get something published. Um, so try to reach out to everyone and don't be afraid of rejection. Um, I think a lot of times when I've spoken to medical students and even in my own journey, um, we tend to take rejection as a reflection of our own capability, whether it's capability as a re potential researcher in the future or capability as a potential IR candidate or capability as um, just a clinician in general. Um, I found out through just a small part of my uh, journey so far that when we send out an email, how we get that response to that email probably 20 to 10, 10 to 20% has to do with what email we wrote and about 80% has to do what else is going on in their very busy universe to the person whose email we sent that to. So um, stay vigilant, um, look at all avenues, both traditional and non-traditional. And I think at this stage, it's really important to be very vocal about what your aspirations are, what you wanna do, and to reach out to everyone for help, um, whether that's residents, whether that's attendings in your own institution, or or if you have particular interest, reaching out to um, attendings at different institutions by just looking up their email in the directory and writing a very sweet email about, hey, this is what I liked about your research. This is who I am. And this is what I'd like to get involved if possible. Um, IR, I found, is a very nice and responsive field. But um, if you don't get a response immediately or if the response isn't perfect, don't worry about it. Just keep looking at all the avenues uh, as there are several to go through and some of them are listed here. Uh, next slide, Omer. There's also another opportunity that I wanted to really talk about and touch on that I found that a lot of people are unaware about, and that's really funding for your research. Um, some of us come from institutions where we can get internal, internal funding, but there's also opportunities like ones that I took advantage of where you can get NIH funding, which is designated specifically for um, medical students interested in research, whether that's um, VIR, plastic surgery, neurosurgery. Um, in my cohort of colleagues, like I did the TL1 program, I found that a lot of my peers were those who were pursuing neurosurgery, plastics, um, orthopedic surgery, uh, or dermatology, and very few were uh, pursuing VIR. And I don't think that's a reflection of the, um, our capability to attain those scholarships. I really think it's a reflection of maybe our overall, you know, knowledge of those scholarships existing or the amount of students applying. So just because, um, like, I was the first person who got my TL1 scholarship I, at uh, WashU for interventional radiology that I'm aware for uh, that I'm aware of, just because I was the first one doesn't mean that it's not so, that's some, that's something that was barred to IR students in the past. So be sure to keep an open mind about where you can get um, research funding. SIR remains like a great opportunity as well. Um, there's a Doctor and Mrs. C. Culp research grant, um, and you don't necessarily have to have found. Um, have a project confirmed or ready to go when you, you know, you know and when, when, when you look at these grants, you can actually use these grants as a great introduction to when, when you're meeting out to, when you're reaching out to your mentors saying, hey, I'd like to get involved. Oftentimes mentors are looking for ways to fund your project if, if they're interested in working with you or, you know, um, making some accommodations work. But if you come in there saying, hey, this is, I've done my research. These are some grants that we can apply together for. I would love if you could help me out with it then that may be a great stepping stone and a great introductory email as well. So um, it, it doesn't have, it can work in any sequence of events you, uh, you'd you like, uh, finding a mentor, then a grant, or finding a grant, and then a mentor. Um, next slide, Amir. 
Um, so again, this just talks about the taking advantage of the granted opportunities here. Um, one thing that remains incredibly important is just sticking to your timelines um, and making sure you're reaching out to people well in advance. Um, next slide. Yeah, so one, one other thing that I wanted to really talk about as a medical student re reaching, out, reaching out to mentors um, that I don't feel like I may have made so clear in the, in the past and I think is important to elaborate on is um, what type of medical student you should be after you reached out. So the first thing is when reaching out to your mentor, uh, definitely be very responsive to their emails. Uh, they're more busy than you are. And if they like email you and you respond to them a week later, uh, probably you know the, the project has a higher likelihood of falling through the cracks. So be more engaged, be more enthusiastic. Don't be afraid to um, really share your ideas and thoughts, although while being respectful. And then when it comes to reaching out to mentors, um, don't be afraid to send out that initial email as well um, and, and tell them, hey, this is what I'm really looking for. Be very clear with your objectives and, and goals and, and, and really ask them. Um, and, and, and if they don't offer directly, like, how do you think I, I should be pursuing the next chapter of my career or, or how I'm, or how I pursue this research. Like, what do you, what do you think my attitude should be? Or what, how do you, how do you think my goals should change? Or um, what objectives should I really meet during my time that I'm working with you? Make sure you have those guidelines and objectives set from the start and don't be afraid to have to ha have those open discussions from the very beginning. Um, other than that, I think really those were kind of the key highlights that I wanted to touch upon. Uh, wanted to speak a little bit more about uh, my work, um, I worked with Dr. Vedantam, as I mentioned, um, we worked on the, uh, completed a track trial, I did a bit of analysis on that, which should be upcoming. At the same time, I was involved in the day-to-day -day of the ongoing C-track trial, which gave me a lot of insight into the inner functionings of a large randomized controlled trial. Um, and the reason, and, and, you know, when I was thinking about applying for a year off, it was a not such a clear cut decision, um, because there was a lot of financial implications or me thinking to myself that, Hey, you know, I'm going to graduate on a different year from my friends. Should I really do this or not? Um, uh, and now when I look back from all that I've learned, I think the answer for me has always been a resounding yes. So, um, feel free to reach out to folks like me. I know I have another, I have a few other peers who have also taken a year off and everyone that I've talked to has feel very, felt very strongly about getting involved, taking a research year, if, if that's really what you're passionate about, or at a very basic level, just being involved. There's a lot to learn about the career um, that you're about to pursue. There's a lot to learn about yourself during those opportunities. And I think it really helps you um, gain a deeper appreciation of evidence-based medicine and, and how you can help your patients uh, both in the clinic, uh, in the in the operating rooms or in geography suites, as well as um, expanding what is already known. So, you know, pushing the boundaries of what is, you know, considered advanced medicine as is. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Um, and if you have any questions uh, for either myself or Dr. V, I'm sure we'd be happy to answer. Yeah, I don't know if Simone is on the, on the conference call. I see her, but uh, I don't know if you're able to speak. But uh, perhaps you could talk about your experience with Northwestern and what you did as a med student. Ooh. I think she's commenting in the chat. She's coming on. So she her project was on 190 radio embolization prostate as well as using depth-taste techniques in HEC. And I think she's going to try to get on, on the line. But in the interim, yeah, if you have any questions, Amir, um, while we're waiting for Simone to come on. And then, uh, Patrick, if you can also respond in the chat on pearls for future rotators. And, you know, they didn't have many options or, or opportunities to rotate on sub eyes last year. But as someone who successfully rotated, uh, can you give some pearls uh, in the chat while we're kind of going through Q&A? Because it's uh, definitely a, a nice to see uh, Patrick on there. There's a lot of words of wisdom. Go ahead, uh, Amir and Vincent. Vincent. Sorry, I, I wanted to make sure I, we didn't miss any questions in the in the chat box from earlier. I remember, I think John John Gosen or Gossen. I'm sorry if I yeah if I spelled his last uh, pronounced his last name wrong, but he had a question that I wanted you to answer. If that sure. was um, is it the um, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so his, his question is, uh, my question is, as a rising MS4 applying for IR, how do you ensure a program is offering adequate VIR training? Um, yeah, no, uh, great question. So I think that's where we need to do better as an organ society in making sure that we're more transparent of what we can offer. And it is a uh, kind of fundamental problem. So what I would do is if you can get the case logs and the block schedule from the integrated residents, I would encourage that. You want to look at the, the types of cases that they're doing, the complexity and their procedural involvement and what year, right? So if you can figure out a way to do that, I would highly encourage it. Um, Sid or Patrick, do you have any thoughts on how to go about doing that? I know Patrick Tran has been their process, so is Sid. Um, yeah, I was actually just uh, focusing on the chat real quick. What would be the, what was the question again? Oh, sorry. Um, so the question was like, you know, going through the process of, uh, you know, interviews, and it was especially virtual. How do you know, like, you know, and you may not know until you kind of are in the midst of process, but how do you figure out which program does what and how your training is going to be? Because, right, so the way I look at it, radiology, you're going to get pretty, there's not a lot of variation in training, right? Like, you're going to get trained. A lot of you can learn it, you know, in the textbooks and whatnot. Um IR procedures or surgeries, whether you're doing, you know, or any interventional surgery is going to be variances, right? If you're a, um, say you're a cardiologist and some programs are going to have a busy structural program, some are not, some are going to have mostly C have do a lot of CTOs, some are not, um, some are going to do endovascular peripherals and venous and carotids, some are not. So how do you, um, how do you identify that as a student? I think that's like an excellent question. And um, one, I think as a medical student approaching IR residency, um, I think the limitations certainly exist. And I think uh, it would be nice to have case logs. I know some residency programs actually provided us with their case logs. They're a little bit difficult to interpret at times, but the most, most important thing that I think that I was able to do um, and others are able to should chime in as well if they had a different approach than me, is I asked the questions point blank, but in a very respectful manner. When it came to continuity <laughs> clinics, that was something that I asked uh, directly is, um, when do you know your residents start rotating in a continuity clinic or is there a continuity clinic in the first place? Um, I figured not being shy about these things in the very get-go would be very helpful for both parties involved. So I think the residency program knew the type of questions I was asking was reflective of the things that maybe I was looking for in a residency program. And then vice versa, they also knew, hey, this student is, um, and, you know, and I also got the answer from them that, hey, this residency program may or may not be a good fit for me. So identifying what those questions are, those details, I think is, is incredibly important. The other thing too is, um, a uh, lot of residents left out their emails after the interview day or the meet and greet on the day before. I certainly took advantage of that, um, reached out to the residents and tried to get really the insider scoop as best as I could, understanding that, you know, everyone will be putting their best foot forward, but it's still very insightful. So um, putting in that effort, I think will certainly go a long way um, and being genuine throughout the process is, is extremely important as well. Thank you, Sid. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, if you already haven't joined the MSC reserves, now's a really great op um, now's a really great time to join because um, there may be some future potential research opportunities in the works, um, uh, especially for reserves who are really passionate about research and want to know more about how they can get involved at the medical school level. Um, so definitely join the reserves. I think there are a couple links posted here on the chat box, but I'd be happy to fish for the link and, and put it out here again. Um, and it's, a, it's also a great opportunity to network with folks like Dr. V, Sid, and many others who have really um, invested a lot of time in us and in our su uh, success on these projects. Um, I was wondering if someone could go over the like, T32 research grant process, I think at the um, MS4 level or even during residency. I think a couple, we had a couple questions about that. Yeah, um, Dr. V, is it cool if I answer this one? Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. So the TL1 and T32, um, from my understanding, and I did the TL1, they're essentially the same thing. A lot of the co coursework that I took at WashU was with the T32 students. Um, 
Now, in terms of how to get into a T32 program in residency, I think there were certain programs that I interviewed at that were very uh, transparent that if you wanted to do a quote unquote research track, you could do that, or you could do, um, which would include a dedicated year of research, or you could actually do a T32 program alongside um, your clinical responsibilities. Now that would be, I think that would allow, that would require the program director to give you a little bit more flexibility during your evenings because a lot of those are those evening classes, but it's certainly, as you're going to, through the interview trail, um, the T32 um, program integration is certainly that I've seen at multiple universities. Again, it was at WashU um, where I was at and it was at other universities as well. Um, in terms of applying to those uh, programs, I think they would be very similar to how you apply for the TL1. You identify a mentor, you come up with a clinical question or a question that interests you, and you submit a five to 10 page research proposal, which is then graded on an NIH scale. So it requires a lot of uh, forethought and a lot of planning, but uh, certainly something which I think is very accessible to VIR trainees and um, should, should, should be considered if, that, if that's the passion that you want to go forward with. Um, I can hop in real quick. Sorry, I was oh, Simone, switching. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, so my research experience. Um, yeah, so I, in between second and third year, I took a one-year research fellowship, uh, fellowship position with Northwestern. Um, the main project that we focused on was doing Y90 radio embolization in the prostate, um, which I'm not sure um, how many people have kind of seen with the talks and stuff. So Dr. Mooley, the P my PI and mentor, um, got, we, we got abstract of the year at SAR for it. Um, I got a training prize for that, but even so we all, we all, I had a side project, um, dealing with, uh, deptase in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, just, but literally within a year of doing these two projects, it opened the door for so many things. Um, you know, I, I got research awards. I got my first publication and, you know, and counting, but also with the extra free time I had, that's kind of when I really indulged in getting myself involved um, with MSC and doing side projects with that, um, you know, chairing the new Women in IR committee um, and even doing other side research projects with uh, a resident from Stanford and resident from MGH. Um, but needless to say, all of it all of this happened and all of my experiences occurred because I took that one year research and really just took advantage of that free time. Um, but I'm forever grateful. And I think honestly, it was probably the best decision I made. I learned so much because before that year I had very like little to no research experience and it just kind of exploded from there. Uh, gained a lot of skills from that. Learned a lot about the field in general. Um, cause I'm like, you know, what's, what's the best way to determine if I actually am interested in IR and that was doing an entire year of IR research and doing those types of procedures um, and exploring that. Um, but yeah, if you, if you're able to, I, I mean, it's one extra, especially if it's a year. I mean, people, a lot of people do um, little smaller ones like clinical projects and clinical trials and stuff like that, or you can do an entire year of like translational re research that I did, but um I will say, you know, when I was thinking about taking that gap year, um, I'm like, well, I know it won't hurt me. <laughs> so it definitely won't hurt, but hurt, it will only help. Um, so if you have the opportunity to, to do it, I'd say 100% do it. I, like I said, I have absolutely no regrets from that. Um, I, I think I made a really good decision. So that's my two cents. <laughs> And if I may make just one more comment to what Simone said, um, something which I've heard about quite a bit is when medical students uh, think, or when medical students and the reserves uh, that I talked to said, hey, you know, I would love to do research, but I have no experience. Is that like a really big drawback? I think um, for me personally, I was very upfront with, with my research mentors that I had no experience and that I think what I really sold when I was like reaching out to them is that despite having no experience, I have tons of passion in terms of interest in learning. So, um, the fact that you haven't done research before should hopefully not be an option, should hopefully not be an obstacle to getting research in the future, as long as you show the passion and the drive and your interest in, in, in acquiring those skills. So I think that's the most important thing. Thanks so much, Simone and Sid for your insights. Um, I did want to cover a quick question. So given that uh, interventional or vascular and interventional radiology has a very unique position when it comes to 
providing these minimally invasive treatment options, how do they work with other specialists like um, the ob guys and the uh, and the, the neurologists and the other specialists who are also uh, taking care of these patients? Yeah, I mean, that can be a, a challenge, right? Because um, each person is biased to thinking that what they do works. So that's why we need evidence to support what we do. Um, and so, uh, you know, ultimately we have to make sure the patient and the public are educated and the primary care physicians are educated about what we can offer so they can at least get a second opinion. So if the primary gatekeeper disease like fibroids is uh, a gynecologist, they may or may not, depending on, you know, how they collaborate or what their kind of bias, inherent biases are, say, you know, I think I want to, so if you look at the study, right, you look at the ME or look at FEMI trials, you could be like, well, you have a 20 to 30% recurrence rate of 10 years. I can be one and done, right? So that may be the way they, they personally think of it and truly believe in it. And that may be fine and right. And we as VIR are like, well, we've got a pinhole in the wrist. Yeah, you'll have a little bit of pain for a week, but you have 70% chance of keeping your uterus and being symptom-free, right? So it depends on you know what uh, side of the coin you look at. But what I do think we need to do is make sure patients and the public are aware if they have a disease that they should at least be seen by a clinical interventionist, right? So whether the gynecologist refers it or the patient comes in directly refers, a lot of my referrals for these kind of syndromes will not be from the specialist. Sometimes it'll be from the patient or from the public, you know, uh, some of the primary, et cetera. So patients are going to have to be the advocate. So we have to get the word out at the medical school level, right? At the um, primary care level, at the public level about these, these uh, options for patients. I think that's, that's our due diligence. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to chime in in the chat, or if you want to turn on your mic, that's also great. Um, we have like a couple more minutes left for any um, final questions. Yeah, feel free to reach out by email um, if you want, or um, and I'd be happy to talk to you further or myself. Okay. I was going to chime in earlier. You asked about oh, Patrick. Uh, yeah. Hey, sorry, I'm like moonlighting. Um, awesome. Earlier, you asked uh, how do you, like as a med student interviewing, how can you really like get a feel for the program, see what the program's like? Um, how do you figure out what kind of practice you want to do later on um, with uh, I guess, kind of feeling out the program, like someone said earlier, free, feel free to just ask. Um, I was part of uh, residency interviews this year. And if someone asked me what I felt the weakness in the program was, I would tell them I would be, I'd be honest, because um, all of us are aware of our program's weaknesses, and we're actually working to improve it all the time. So um, that's something you can just ask. And there are things that each program just doesn't uh, uh, offer. And we'll let you know as well. Um, it's something that we can always change. We can work on fixing. Um, with regards to uh, how do you find what you want to do? Office-based stuff, more academic, academic stuff, private practice. I think ultimately figure out uh, what you enjoy doing, what means a lot to you. Don't fall into the trap of, well, so-and-so does this. And I just want to be like them. I mean, that if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But for me, for example, I really enjoy teaching. I find that the most joy I get in my rotations, even this year, is when I have a med student with me. And so um, for me, maybe that means academics early in my career. And who knows, maybe that will change. And it's still going to change for you as well, regardless of what you um, decide upon now. So not too much stress, but take some time and um, reflect and see what you really want. And feel free to be open and honest at your uh, interviews. And like I said in the chat, um, auditions and rotations. It's all about just showing your work ethic and passion. Um, this is going to be what you want to go into. So if you're going to do a rotation in this field, don't half-ass it. Don't be mediocre because if you're mediocre and this is your best, then you're, you're an applicant that's mediocre at best. So uh, give it your all. But if you really enjoy what you do, um, it'll hopefully be a really enjoyable experience. Thanks so much, Patrick. That was really insightful. Um, as a as an MS three, definitely gonna 
look back at this podcast and, and replay through some of the advice I've been hearing, especially yours. Um, I had one quick question for Dr. V, if, if he doesn't mind, because I, I'm, I've been really curious about um, how uh, VIR attendings adapt to all this rapidly um, emerging technology, um, especially with like PADs and other service lines. Like how, how do attendings adapt um, and grow their practice um, as new studies come out, as new level one evidence comes out and things are changing so quickly? Yeah, great question. So a couple ways. One is going to meetings. I think you have to, if you don't go to meetings, you'll be falling behind. Having a network, I mean, we have a very close network of friends uh, at, the, at the faculty level. So we talk to one another, not infrequently share ideas and approaches. And then the industry. So working closely with the industry, the industry that the representatives of the industry will have, they'll you know, present their new devices. And then you take the look at the data on your own and make a thing, but they have a lot of experience. So a combination of those features will help, right? So to keep up um, and then kind of, yeah, I think those are the main ways to keep up with the latest and greatest. Meetings are the key though, you know, especially in-person meetings because a lot of discussion is after the meeting where you're talking about, oh, I did this and oh, can you, and then you pull up their, pull up their laptop and show a case and having that friend network around the country. And you guys are developing it right now with these, um, the, the MSC. So you're going to have, you know, Sid's going to be doing this chronic venous thing and he's going to be like, hey, I deployed this. Simone's going to be like, I threw a Y90 and a prostate cancer. And, you know, St. Patrick's going to do, God knows what he's going to do. Uh, some fever, uh, you know, from the aortic valve down. So whatever it may be, you're going to meet all these experts um, like through these events and you're going to network and interact. You're going to have your cell phones and you're going to go, hey, try this out. Okay. And that's how you keep up. Yeah. 